Hi everyone, this is Dr. Charles Lee. Before this episode starts, I have a small favour to ask from you. Many visit and uh, watch the videos and they find it very informative, they get excited. Um, some of them write to me on my email, but they don't subscribe. So, would you do me a small favor? Would you just press that subscribe button? Um, it'll be so good for all of us. Uh, certainly, it helps the channel grow. It adds a little bit of vitality to the channel. At the same time, the numbers uh, get bigger and, I, and my heart gets bigger too. So, just to know that you're with me, uh, you enjoy the company and I enjoy your company, you won't believe it. So, please, subscribe, press that button. I want to hear those bells jingle. And most of all, stay tuned and I love your company. We'll talk again. Welcome everyone to Hard Talk, coming to you live from Kota Kinabalu in Sabah in Malaysia. Whichever part of the world you're from, I want to welcome you because I just love your company. So as the introduction said, you know, please subscribe, press that button because you'll be amazed all the guests that we have on this channel. And I just want this channel to grow. So once again, uh, let me humbly request for you to press that subscribe button and I'd love to have your company. Now, hard talk is about real life issues. It's about heart to heart conversations concerning health, wealth, lifestyle, living, and spirituality. And uh, we are facing so many challenges today. And it keeps us restless because the world is ever changing. Every moment, things are happening before us. But it's all about the inner world at the same time. And so many of us, you know, come through life with all sorts of experiences. And I want to say that uh, if life is your biggest project, try considering writing about it. Because I can tell you one thing that many of us go through life with scars, with all sorts of hurts and baggage, and we go to the grave with it because we don't want to write about it. We don't want others to know about it. And that's the culture that we've grown up in. But Maya Angelou said, there is no greater agony than bearing a untold story inside of you. My guest today is a living embodiment of what it takes to become an excellent writer, especially a memoir writer. Name is Marion Roach Smith. She's been a writer for more than 30 years. She's been teaching memoir writing for more than 20 years. She currently teaches more than 100 students a month on online classes. She has a website and take note, a website, marionroach.com, which has just cleared over more than a million views. And so today we have the real deal with us this morning. Um, it's 8.30 on my side, and she's the author of this book called The Memoir Project, which we're going to talk about. And if you're thinking of writing, if it's in your heart, in your mind, get this book because it's a gateway to setting you free. And I want to read while I'm holding it, the back cover, whether or not one has lived an exceptional or dramatic life, we inherently know that writing memoir is the single greatest portal to self-discovery. So join me and let's welcome Marion Roach Smith coming to us live from upstate New York on a Tuesday at 8.36 p.m. Welcome, Marion. You. I'm good. I'm good. And uh, wow, there she is, the one and only. <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen, um, you know, doing that introduction is just unbelievable because I've been really praying very hard to try and find a breakthrough through what I'm doing because I'm in the midst of writing my own memoir. And uh, to have you in front of me, I mean, first of all, I want to thank God for you because, you know, you're such a gift to humanity. Um, oh. Your writing, your books, the, your effort, your whole life 
you have given and put it on paper. And uh, I want to congratulate you for what you're doing, uh, your team, and especially now at this part of your life. Um, I'm so glad to have met you right now face to face. And, uh, you know, you know, we have just finished uh, this weekend on American Idol. And uh, the host is called Ryan Seacrest. And he always says this. He says, Tom, dim the lights and let's go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to take a page off your book and start this way. It says, are you ready to unlock the floodgates, remove the tunicate and let the platelets flow? I'm totally with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mary, listen, talk to us. What's it like? to be a successful writer? What's the life been like now for you? Looking back through the lens, 30 years, 40 years ago, how you grew up, what's it life now for you? Well, it's deeply gratifying because it's what I always wanted to do from the time I was a little girl. And I always thought that as my mother taught me to read that those words became sentences and those sentences become paragraphs. And those paragraphs become stories that you can entertain people with, you can inform them, you can make them cry, you can make them laugh. And the ability to share our humanity is just such a gift person to person. And that's what writers do. They, took, they take on something and they say, let's have a little look at this. Why don't we have a little look at grief? Why don't we have a little look at humor? Why don't we have a little look at children or disease or whatever it is? And I've written about a vast number of subjects over the many years of my career. And each time I have felt a shared humanity with, with whom I'm trying, whoever I'm trying to inform. So it's a very gratifying thing to do for a living. I'm sure, I'm sure, because it's all punctuated with all sorts of emotions, isn't it? I mean, yes. you know, the whole day, I mean, we're all very emotional beings. I mean, I remember, I mean, all of us write, all of us read right from, you know, young days, from childhood, from school days. I remember reading Enid Blyton and, uh, you know, Black Beauty and Pilgrim's Progress and Animal Farm and all that. I remember, but... I never thought of getting into that space of writing until now. I mean, I've been writing all my life as a doctor, as a surgeon. Um, you know, I've got a blog up that I've been doing. But to get into that space of wanting to be a writer, which I'm going to come to in a moment. But you grew up in a whole world of journalism. There were, there were people all around you. Um, yeah. Was that a contributing factor, Marion? Absolutely. Both my parents were newspaper people. My sister's a newspaper person. My husband's a newspaper person. My friends are all writers. And it's something that you would like to have if you're going to write in the same way you need the support of surgeons, of doctors, of people in the medical field to bounce ideas off of, to understand your fail failures, to understand your successes, to understand the people you're working with. So yes, for me to grow up with writers was a deep inspiration. And I learned early on that the people that made other people laugh had a lot of power. And I thought, hmm, that looks like a curious thing to do for a living. So humor in particular seemed to me to be something that I wanted to aspire to be, to be, I mean, to be humorous. That, that's, that's perfect. I mean, that's brilliant. Because to grow up in a family that's so literate, mm -hmm. it's a gift. Yes, because I can is. imagine the conversation at the dinner table, in the dining table. And you know what? You know, that kind of thing. And it stimulates. It creates yes. that curiosity because the conversation is something very real and not what's happening on the TV and all the stuff that's in the world. But it's about our inner selves, isn't it? I mean, it's fantastic to feed on one another. So you have been gifted, Marion. You've been gifted. Well, I think it's, yes, it was a very privileged upbringing in that way to be in a house of books and in a house of people who read them. So I think that it's the greatest gift you can give to teach a child to read. It's the greatest gift you can do, give to take a child to a library and let them choose the books that they want to read and then talk about them with them, right? People talked about books in our house and that was very important to me. And I grew up wanting to write them. So I feel like, I guess I, it's my dream come true. Fantastic. I mean, 90% of writing is reading, isn't it? Yes, um, and absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And so my question would be, why write? Why become a writer? Well, the power of putting one word after the other is much more than that. The idea of being able to annotate what you have on yourself, because everything that we've ever said, felt, th thought, eaten, every movie we've ever seen, it's all in there. And so when we write, we're annotating, we're pulling from what we have on us. And it's a gorgeous process of trust and adventure and creativity. 
and nothing in the world is like it. People talk about being in the zone when they run marathons. Yeah. But people also talk about being in the zone when they're writing, because what we're doing is a very, very intimate process of pulling from our conscious and unconscious minds, all those things that are down there and letting them inform one another in sentences. That's pretty phenomenal when you think about the process that, that we get to go through on demand when we sit down and say to ourselves, I wanna write a piece, I wanna write a piece that's about this glory of being a mother, but I wanna be very specific. I wanna write a piece that's based on this little moment I had. And then you start to really pull from that and try to figure out what the piece is really about, which is the key to all writing. What's this really about? Yeah, I mean, we're gonna go into that deeply because uh, there's a portion of my conversation which I've titled The Anatomy of Writing because as a doctor, as a surgeon, I mean, that's the first thing we learn and that's the anatomy. Um, but you use the word phenomenon. So is writing a phenomenon? Is it a craft? Is it a skill? Is it a calling? How would you how would you put writing a, or a writer to be a writer into what kind of a, of a world is it? I mean, is it something? Well, it's, a, per, it's a pursuit. It's an artistic right. pursuit, I believe. And so some people consider it a craft. Some people consider it an art. For me, it's a job. And I take it very seriously as a job. And it's been a lifelong pursuit. So it absolutely begins with reading. That is completely true, but it doesn't end. You don't stop reading when you start writing. You read more and you read better and you read over your head. You've got to read books that are way over your head so that you understand what's required and you're thinking. But I think it's a pursuit and I think it's available to everyone. I genuinely believe that everyone has stories to tell. It's just that they've either been told they're not worth it or there's no money in it or who wants to hear from you or there's just too much repression around writing. And that's a shame because honestly, everyone has things that we would all benefit from hearing about. You know, Marion, this is beautiful because if somebody's listening in now, I've got a lady out there who wants to do journalism, for example. I mean, let's say, I mean, I, my, my perspective now, looking at the lens now, because I'm in the process of doing it now. But if my daughter had come up to me and said, Dad, I want to be a writer, my vices, my proceris, my super silly would have all gone into a depressive mode. <laughs> yeah. you know? I mean, they, they, they all, all three are doctors today, but if one of them said, I want to be a writer, and I say, what? You know, I mean, because there's there's nothing in there, especially in this part of the world, to be a journalist. What can you get out of it? I mean, you just be writing. But now, I think it's such a gift. I think it's it's a world that you're healing yourself with in the whole process till the very end, isn't it? Yes, mm. you absolutely are. And I and I mean that when on the back cover of the book, it says it's the single greatest portal to self-discovery. It is. I don't know how I feel about anything until I sit down and write about it. And I don't think most people do either. We talk in sentence fragments. We don't think through. Think about what you believe about faith, right? Think about it for a second. You think, um, I believe, and most of what you believe is dogma, is what you've been trained or taught or repeated. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's very comforting. It's very foundational. You can chant it. You can repeat it, the same prayers or hymns or songs or whatever you've got. But if I really ask you, no, no, I want to know what you think about faith. Sit down and write about it. And you'll discover that you actually have deep, complex feelings about faith and it's worth doing what do you really think about your children oh i love them peace people say no 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 talk to me about each one of them write about each one of them you'll find that you understand the distinctions that you can discern between one child and another in a way that's deeply felt and wonderfully informed that you didn't know you could articulate until you sat down to write about it i mean that's and wouldn't they love to read that <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, wouldn't they want to read that? But, you know, talking about that, I think we're living in a world today where there's so much of restlessness and there are people feeling hopeless. And yet yeah, there's yeah. a book out there written by somebody who's exactly in the same space. And it's so rewarding to be able to read that and be yes. comforted that there's another person with you. You've got a companion and you're walking along the same road. It's you know? amazing. My first book was written from uh, after I wrote a magazine piece for the New York Times magazine when I was in my 20s. And I was the first person to ever write a first person account about an Alzheimer's patient. That Alzheimer's patient happened to be my mother. She was 49 years old when she got sick. And no one had ever written about this before. It doesn't seem possible. No one had heard of the disease. And the New York Times took a big chance on letting me at 26 write this piece. 
And the letters, when the piece was published on a Sunday, the letters started coming in in mailbags, literally people from all over the world writing to me saying, I didn't know anyone else had this. I didn't know there were other people out there. I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. And this was before there was an Alzheimer's Association. This is before there was funding for research. It was just the most remarkable experience to hear from people who like me had kind of been home alone with my patient. And my patient was so young, that's the only reason anybody cared about it. Otherwise, if she had been 90 experiencing the symptoms of senility, we would have said, yeah, yeah, what can you expect? But it was so shocking to people that she was so young. And it allowed me to understand the power of story at a very, very young age, that we can bond, that we can coalesce around our, our shared needs. It was a beautiful experience amid a really very sad experience of my life. Yeah, which, which brings me to the topic of the power of storytelling, isn't it? I mean, there's there's so much in it that you can set people free through your story. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and I think this is something that, uh, you know, it's so fascinating. And you said this earlier, uh, growing up in a world of, you know, a literate family, that a word can become a sentence and a sentence can create an idea and ideas have consequences. And they can yes. become a reality that can change lives. What a beautiful transition that can take one person from one place to another. And, 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 I, and I love you for that, for what you're doing, because uh, you're going through so many lives. You know, thousands of people have come through you and each one has a story. Imagine uh, if, if we can all gather in one place and, you know, and have an, uh, an encyclopedia, you know, <laughs> of different emotions <laughs> that go through life. But um, the important thing I think here when I'm trying to get from you is the psyche, the mind. There's so much going on about mindset and how we have now to conform to so many things happening outside in the world, which, which we have no control of, but we can certainly control the way we live. And, yes. uh, and, and I think this is something that I want your thoughts on that. I mean, how much of the mindset is important when one is writing? So I think the mindset is very important. First of all, you have to believe that your story has worth. And that's t tough, depending on the subject. I talk to people all day long. I talk to memoir writers all day long. And, and the question is, who's going to want to read this? I mean, it's, it's just me and my sister who committed suicide that I'm writing about. It's just me and my child who was sick. It's just me. I had an abusive marriage, someone will say. And I want to write about what I learned in that experience. And I say, there we are. What did you learn? What was the human transcendence? What was, I refer to it as the human pilot light. You know, that little light on your stove that, that keeps lit. What kept your pilot light lit? I'll ask people during an 32 years of an abusive relationship. How did you keep going? And they say, well, you know, I, I think it was because I had this aunt who used to tell me that whatever, and then she'll tell me the story about, and that little Beacon of hope stayed lit in her because one person in her life had told her she had worth. And what we do when we write memoir is we establish those kinds of truths about ourselves. We ask ourselves, how did I get through that? How did I endure that? Or if it's not a sad story, how did I ever become less of something? Maybe you're a big egomaniac and you know, you're running around and being a type A person, and then you end up having a, what you think is a heart attack in the ER, you know, you're in the ER and the doctor says, that's not a, that's not a heart attack. That's a panic attack. And <laughs> you need to calm down and you can write a book about learning to meditate in which you can talk about what it's like to dial down from being a type A person to being a calm person who's considerate of your own feelings and someone else, uh, someone else's feelings. And these are the kinds of stories that allow us to move into our headspace get in there and go back and annotate those moments of transcendent change from when we believed one thing to when we believed another. And that's the power of memoir. I mean, beautiful. I mean, you said the word that, uh, that to me is, uh, and I'm going <laughs> to, there's so much I want to talk to you about, but, but the word you use is transcendency. I mean, you know, that is to me very, very powerful because it's going beyond the normal. It's going into a space that is not you. And then you realize it is you. And, right. uh, and, and that is very, very interesting. And, and I want to move from the power of storytelling to the love of language. 
I mean, when I read your book, I mean, the memoir, and I think of those fingernails and flipping through those cards and the way you put it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, being a plastic surgeon, I'm very conscious when they walk into my clinic, you see what's on the lipstick, the color, their, their face, their eyeshadow, their fingernails. It tells a story about the person that walks in to see me. Yes, I bet. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll come to the other part, which is even more interesting, but, but still... Um, you know, and so the way you write, you write in the beginning and you say, read this and, you know, and there she is flipping. And I could have just written there and said, I should just went through the cards, but you've got the fingernails and you've got the color of the, of the nails. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought that now to me, this is an interesting woman, you know, <laughs> because, because she, she's paying, you know, attention to details. And, yes. uh, and I think that's, Critical, isn't it, Marion, writing a book? Yes. Details are essential. And we are so filled with them in our minds. And the thing that you want to do is to train your mind, go into your mind and say, look, I'm writing this story is really about mercy. I'm going to write a story about forgiving someone and how I was able to show mercy to this relative that hurt me or this person who misunderstood me. So you go into your subconscious and you say, just, I, I want to, I really want to, write about mercy. Now, what details do I have from a time when that person showed me some really bad behavior? And what did I have to forgive them for? And what is what is mercy? And what does it feel like? And you have this internal monologue while you're writing. What am I writing about? I'm writing about learning to be merciful. Okay, that's interesting. Now, what does that look like? Did I, when I used to see that person in, at family dinners and I was so mad at him, I probably sat like this and all tight and, you know, with my elbows next to my body. And now as I'm more filled with mercy for them, perhaps I'm able to reach out and touch them. Perhaps I'm able to, to, to be softened in myself. Perhaps I understand why they were so hard on all of us. So the details are so important. What happens to us as we forgive? What happens to us mentally? How do we look? How do we feel? How do we speak? How does our language change? And these are great experiences for writers if you're writing from anywhere is to try to remember what happened. Absolutely, the who, what, when, where, and why of it. But then also the gestures of the people involved because with a gesture, you can show hardness, coldness, affection. You can show almost every human emotion and you don't want to tell your writer, your, your reader, you don't want to say she was angry. You want to show them angry. What do you do when you're angry? Do you lean forward? Do you lean back? Do you fix, do you twiddle your hair when you're nervous? Do you flip your fingers through the card file like my mother does in that opening scene of that book? And was she wearing red lacquered nail polish? Yes, she was. And it gives you a sense of who she is. So details are your supporting characters amid what you're discussing. And we don't want everything. We don't want to know, you don't want to know the wallpaper and the color of the seat cushion. You want to know only the things that drive the story forward. And that's where a writer's eye gets developed. You know, what's an important detail in the story? And this is the beauty of storytelling. You learn to go into your subconscious and only get what you need and leave the rest behind. It's what beginning writers struggle with most. They get everything. And they come out and they want to say, at two, it was Tuesday at 4.30 in the afternoon when I picked up my eight-year-old daughter at 254 First Street in New York City. And, you know, the reader just says, what? What am I going to do with all that detail? Instead, you say, I strode into her school to pick her up. You know, you strode. You were glad to get there or you were on a mission or something. You want to be able to communicate to us what's going on. But we don't need all the details, all the numbers, all of the colors. So that's the adventure of writing, is learning to choose, to discern. And it is a great adventure. I uh, love you for, for saying all this because uh, I hear your voice, I hear your heart. Uh, it reminds me of me doing my ward rounds and the, the junior doctors will start off, oh, this is a 57-year-old lady with blood. I said, stop it. What the hell is she in here for? <laughs> 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 you know, stop you know, it yeah. stop it get to the point you know I, I i got my knife in my hand just tell me what i'm supposed to do but uh but love you i mean such a beautiful terrain of thoughts and emotions that take you into a book um yes. so we talked about storytelling and the power of it we talked about language and the love of it um, i want to take you to this sentence listening with your ears um you know Ma malcolm gladwell 
super writer. He wrote the book Blink. Yes. The power to think before you're thinking about what you're thinking. And his last chapter is titled Listening with Your Ears. And really, it's about listening to the voice of the writer in those pages. You see, uh, what you are talking now is that you're reading. At the same time, I can hear the, the writer talking to me. And, yes. and that's a beautiful aspect of a memoir, isn't it, or, uh, for a writer? Uh, yes. Everything that you said, I mean, you know how we, we can read something and glance over a page and not hear the writer. Yes. And not hear what Absolutely. the voice is coming through. But yeah. uh, what you're telling us is that uh, it's such a transcendent experience to go with the writer, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. And, and uh, this is where, you know, I, I love you for the way you're bringing it to us. And I want to go and take you to the world of forensic medicine, which you have visited before. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you there'll be no blood splattered all over the place. Oh, too bad. <laughs> I love a good blood spatter early in the morning. <laughs> but I, but I tell you when I, when I read that I I was I thought to myself oh, I just wish I was your neighbor Marion because I, <laughs> <laughs> my friends never want to hear about that because it's usually at a dinner party when someone will say did you write a book on forensic science and I say yes and they say I don't want to hear about it at over dinner <laughs> I, I don't want to hear about it but but I, 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 that's great that you did that because like nobody it, I mean it was such a great adventure to go behind the scenes in the world of forensic sciences you. No, well, the, the scenes of surgery, the the adventures of medicine are extraordinary. Yeah. yeah, but the way you took it out and put it into a reality, and that is you talked about the vertebrae and that how a blog can be a, like a vertebrae. And then you put yes. a blog upon a blog upon a blog, so a vertebra, and that's the spine of your memoir. And I thought, yes. brilliant, you know. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> the, the way you put bone and bone together and then the ribs like, you know, encompassing over the heart and how it protects the heart of the book um, is, is, is a brilliant way to think about it. So, you know, in plastic surgery, we spend so many years learning how not to do it. Hmm. Okay, because once you make an incision, there's no way of reversing it. And that right. scar is for life. So talk yes. to us about, you know, I'm going to, I'm writing a book. How do I write and learn how not to write? In other words, so, leave out yeah. the stuff that's, you know, like you've been mentioning all this while that people don't want to hear about. But, you know, there's so much that's happened in my life, but I can't put the whole thing because it's, it's not a memoir. That's not an autobiography. It's a memoir. It's, a, it's part of it. So talk to us right. about... Uh, how do I channel a way in which that, um, you know, it's important for the reader? So I talk about your first draft being what I call your vomit draft. Yeah. And we talked, we, we laughed about this before we went live. And it's a really, really good thing to keep in mind that that first draft is you just want to cough up everything you know about one subject. You know, we're not looking for autobiography. There's a very big distinction between memoir and autobiography. Mem autobiography is, is a book encompassing your entire life. Memoir is best written from one area of your expertise at a time, from one area. So you have maybe 12 areas of expertise. I define those as what you know after what you've been through. So sometimes I write from a caretaking point of view, from when I talked about my mother, I can talk about the 12 dogs I've lived with in my life. I can write from my expertise of gardening, but I don't write a caregiving gardening dog book. I write from one area of my expertise at a time. So when we write memoir, no matter what the length, we should choose an area of expertise. We should choose what we want to share with the reader. I want to share that dogs do things for people that people cannot do for themselves. And I'm going to write a book using the 12 dogs that I've had in my life, right? So we say, okay, well, that's narrowing it down. Now I'm going to write a vomit draft. I'm going to write a big, fat, overblown, version of those 12 dogs and what they've taught me in my life. Because what I know after living with 12 dogs is that dogs do things for people that people cannot do for themselves. And that's what the book is going to take on. It's just going to go from here to there and taking that on. But the vomit draft is going to be too big and have too many stories and make the same points over and over again. But I'm going to write that vomit draft. It's like packing a trunk. If you ever took, sent your kid off to camp and you pack a big old trunk, right? For that two months they go to camp. The next draft is going to be taking that trunk and turning it into an overnight bed. We're nice. going to take out 
18 of those sweaters and five nice. pairs of dungarees and most of the socks. And we're going to take stuff out so that you make each point once. Because here's the deal. Memoir writing is just like adding up the beads on an abacus. You want this scene plus this scene plus this scene plus this scene to make the point that dogs do things for people that people cannot do for themselves. I don't want a big story on the history of dogs from you. I want your position from your area of expertise on the dogs you've lived with and what you're willing to share with me. Memoir is smaller and it just goes from here to there, from when you could not do something to when you could, from when you did not know something to when you did, or from when you had to shed something to when you did and life got better. It's much smaller in its ambition than, than autobiography. And guess what? It's a much better read. Wow, fantastic. I mean, well put, uh, Marion. Listen, you know, we're talking about the anatomy. It's like taking a muscle and learning the origin and the insertion because every muscle has got its own function. Uh, uh, before you talk about the whole whole muscle that come, you know, as a whole. So when you're talking about writing with intent, so there are two words that I, I was kind of like uh, thinking about, and that is be hospitable. Yes. Could you touch that for us? So I'd say it's pretty much the, the phrase I live by, is to be hospitable to your talent. Be hospitable. Carry a notebook with you. Make sure that you can write down when you're sitting at the traffic light and suddenly you see something that just reminds you of a childhood experience or a person or something pops into your head or a song lyric comes on that stirs a memory. Be able to write it down. When you've had an extraordinary experience with one of your kids and somebody has said something and somebody has said something else and you say, wow, I need to write that down. Those quotes were formidable in my belief about parenting. So be hospitable, have something on you all the time. Maybe you speak into your phone, maybe you take notes on your phone. It's fine, but every writer I know needs to have a piece of paper, some way to write it down, whether it be a digital paper or, or a physical paper. And be hospitable at your desk. Don't pile your taxes on your desk. Make sure you can get to your desk because most of the writers I work with, and I've worked with thousands of them, they only have an hour a day maybe to write. They don't have eight hours a day. So you need to be able to get to the desk and get to work. So be hospitable to yourself. And then be hospitable to your brain and your heart. Read well and think deeply. And when you go to the movies and you leave the movie, think about how did they run that? How did they unfold that story? How did they do that? Get the screenplay. Screenplays are almost all available online. Go back and read it. Study how the story moved. Be hospitable. Don't expect to sit in a chair and have it all show up. Make sure the chair is cleaned off. Make sure you've got a notebook on you. Make sure that you've done some research, but be hospitable to your talent and it'll show up and in your work. Amazing. I mean, this is discipline. This is, uh, yes. you're a surgeon in writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, discipline is a really important word. I sit on a lot of panels. I get invited to a lot of panels to talk about writing. And every time someone will say, what is creativity? And how do you get it? And the person next to me will say, well, you communicate with your angel on the right side of your brain. And then, and then the next person will say, well, I burn a lot of incense and I do this. And I'll say, it's discipline. It's a hard chair. It's a clean desk. And it's one hour a day. You write 500 words a day, five days a week. If you write three pages a day, five days a week, that's 15 pages a week. It's 60 pages a month. That's a first draft of 300 pages in five months. And everybody always looks at me like, oh, she's too strict. I said, no, no, you get a five, you get a 300 page first draft of a book in five months. If you write three pages a day, that's true. So why wouldn't you show a little discipline? No, I mean, this is, this is the truth of the matter. I mean, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart, isn't it? I mean, it's about you're investing your time and uh, you know, in everything that that's involved and you want people to know you. I mean, like I said, you don't want to hear a voice, which is uh you know, damp, you want to hear the real sharp, critical voice in there and, and yes. speak and change somebody else's life. But you talk so much about cumulative, isn't it? I mean, you're just bringing it through uh, yes. the whole experience, right? Until it's very end. But talking about this, I mean, what's the, you know, there's so much about preface, uh, introduction, prologue, you know, um, you know, you talk about trailers of a movie that you said, if I start off with a dramatic incident as my prologue, I want to get everybody all into that mode that, oh my God, what happened in the next, you know, and then take them through. Yeah. Yeah. You want to hook them. 
You want to hook them, hook them early, hook them hard. Those are our two favorite expressions. Hook them early, hook them hard. Uh, made them Don't made let them go. And so if you open with a dramatic scene, in memoir, if you open with the worst thing that ever happened and just do it for a page, a page and a half, and then jump back and tell the story from childhood, tell the story slowly, you're going to have us because we know that terrible scene is coming back. And we think, wait a minute, how did that beautiful little life he's showing us now, how did it ever get to that place that that first page he gave us? Or open with the best, open with an amazing scene of happiness and joy, and then jump back to a scene of something else entirely. And we say, oh, what? And once you have your reader hooked, you got them. I tell you, you know, the way you talk about Emily Dickinson and the one ribbon at a time. <laughs> <laughs> She's my favorite, favorite writer. I know I can feel you because, you know, it's like watching the sunset and then start thinking of all those ribbons and how they knitted together. And yeah. uh, you get a dress out of it at the end. You know what I mean? That yes. kind of feel. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, but there's so much of emotions that goes into writing, isn't it? I mean, how do you control yourself? You know, I mean, uh, if you're on a page yeah. that's uh, that's taking you into a very dark place, you know, the, the emotions can run wild. Um, they can. They can. They can. And, you know, I mean, I've always said that, you know, it's like looking into a mirror. Mirrors don't lie. And shadows never leave you. Yeah. So when you're writing about yourself, I want to take you to this part of it, which is, I think, very important as we got a few more uh, minutes left. Um, dazzle me. <laughs> I told my staff, I said, look, I'm going to tell every patient that walks inside here, dazzle me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they do from now on. Uh, yeah. Or, or get the patient to tell me, uh, doctor, would you dazzle me, Charles? You know, that kind of thing. But it's such a beautiful word. You know why? Because, you know, when I, when I sat down to write, I, I took a sabbatical for like two years now just to be able to spend some time with myself. And, uh, and I was writing this thing called the, the, the seven creative zones of a mindful genius. And Lovely. because it was keeping my mind going, right? But it was not the book that I was meant to write. So until I really got on to writing what I was meant to do, and that is uh, about my own life, my spiritual life, which was what I was called for. So talk to us about this whole, I know you, you, you mentioned this in all your, your interviews and conversations about truth. You see, um, the, which I want to kind of close with this part of it because it's so important. There are so many things on the internet, ghostwriters, my writers, your writers, you don't know who the hell to trust. And um, right. and I always talk about this conversation that took place, you know, nearly 2000 years ago between two personalities. One was a governor called Pontius Pilate and the other one was a cosmic Christ, the Jesus of Nazareth. And Pontius Pilate yeah. asked Jesus, what is truth? And, uh, and, you know, when, when, when the Lord sort of said that I am the truth, I am the way, the truth and the life sets you free. So for me, when I'm writing my truth, I'm free. I don't owe my truth to anyone else. Is that correct? Is that the right way a writer should be? It's your truth. I believe that. Absolutely. And your sister will have another version of the same exact Christmas morning, right? The best Christmas of your life. You had the best Christmas of your life, she'll say, oh, that Christmas, that was horrible because we are having separate realities all the time. And I want to know what yours is. That's why I'm reading your book. That's why I'm reading your essay. That's why I'm listening to you on the radio because I am interested. I'm interested in this shared experience called life. But you must, when you write memoir, accept the fact that there's a different version out there. So there isn't one truth of any experience but it's your truth that we're after. This is the way it happened to you. And when your sister says, it didn't happen that way, you get to say, you're right. It didn't happen to you that way. It happened to me that way. That's the way it happened to me. And this is what makes memoir so remarkable because I'm saying, I'm literally asking you, how did you change? What was your transcendence? Tell me about when you were this and how you got to that. Because I want to have the courage to take the journey myself. And that's what we do when we write memoir. We give each other a leg up in this life. And I think it's a beautiful form. Beautiful. I mean, that's, I mean, hearing you, you made my day. It's morning here and it's night for you. But uh, <laughs> because, you know, this, this word dazzled me with your truth. 
Um, I I was with my son the other day and we were just driving and I was looking at one of those nice big boards out there on along the road and it had the word resplendence. Mm. And I, you know, I opened up my phone and I started to Google because I never heard of the word before. And it was about dazzling, you know, getting into that zone that dazzles you, you know. Yes. And uh, and I think this is a a powerful thing. But talking about truth, um, how do you pitch yourself, Marion? Um, you, you say pictures of on one story that takes you all the way through. So be it revenge, be it betrayal, be it mercy, you talk about that. So when does that pitching oneself start? Is it right in the beginning that this is going to be my story on mercy and then right? Is that, is that what you're trying to yeah. say? What interests you, right? Like, so what interests you is, is the thing to ask yourself all the time, because you may be on this, if you're writing a book, you may be on it for several, a couple of years, right? It better interest you. So what are you thinking about, you know, in, in your part of the world, in this part of the world, in, in what's in the ether, what's, what's coming up on the calendar? What is it you want to talk about? What is it you want to think about for a while? And that's what always gets me going. I think, what do I want to, what, what do I know about mercy? Have I got any good stories on mercy? You know, what's in the ether right now? In the United States, where I live, we're talking a lot about truth because we went through an administration where there was no truth. We went through an administration that challenged everybody else's truth. And we're still reeling from that. And I think it's really worth understanding that all the writers I know started writing essays about truth and about their own truths. And we tend to write with an idea of what is in the ether. What are we, what are others thinking about? What are we talking about? It's very helpful to take this on, to give words to people that they don't have perhaps about their own experience is maybe the greatest gift we can give them. So it's not that we're so smarty pants. It's just that we're willing, I'm willing to sit here and kind of hash it out and try to think if I, do I have anything to say about this? Right after September 11th in this country, the terrible tragedy of, of 9-11, yeah. I, I read an essay on, on live radio that I thought could be helpful about the World Trade Center. And, and my producer at, at, at National Public Radio said it was very helpful to him to hear it about a different time in those buildings. And it just reminded us of what they were. It's all I could do. I couldn't cure it. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't change it but I could give us a reminder of what those buildings once were to many of us. And that's what I could bring to it. So I think that's what we're asking is you bring your truth to the best of your abilities to this large human adventure called life. Oh, beautiful. I mean, you know, the reason why I asked you this was because way back, you're 22 years old, you know, 1983, uh, you're trying to put some sense into this whole atmosphere of madness within inverted commas happening. And there was so much happening in your family too. I mean, there's so much, I, I go through the words in there. And yet when you talk about pitching, um, you, you made a sentence there and it says that uh, the dramatic story of a family struggle with Alzheimer's disease. So was Alzheimer's disease the pitch? Because well, there's the so pitch, many happening yeah. around, so much is happening right. around it. How, yeah, how the pitch, you, uh, yeah. That's a good question. The pitch, the pitch was absolutely my assignment was to explain Alzheimer's disease to people. And no one had heard of it. So the pitch was to explain it, but you, I had to do it on the backs of my family. In other words, we had to be the characters so that you would care. If I just wrote a clinical piece about Alwa Alzheimer discovering the disease in 1906 and the neurofibrillary tangles and the dendritic plaques and all of the things, you know, I, I've already lost you. I mean, so I housed it on my 50, she was 51 by the time the piece was was published. I housed it on her and I describe her. And then I say, and I say she's, she, she's angry, hostile, incompetent, incontinent. She doesn't recognize me. She doesn't know my name. And then I say, my mother was 51 years old. And it, it kills you to read. You say, what? How is that possible? So the pitch was to write about Alzheimer's disease, but to write about it from the most humane point of view I could possibly bring to it, which was as a daughter, a daughter who was struggling horribly as her mother was losing her mind. And the phrase I came up with was that she was losing her mind in handfuls. And it's a phrase that's been repeated to me thousands of times. People have written to me in letters saying that that phrase just grabbed them um, because she was and it worked. So that was my pitch was how can I make people care? 
my goal writing about it was to get some funding started, to get some research started. There was nothing. So my pitch was that I wanted people to care. I wanted to break their hearts to tell you the truth. So they would, you know, do something about it. Oh, brilliant. I mean, you know, this is, this is what I mean by, you know, really knowing the anatomy of the person writing. And, and I know because I was writing this book and it's called ICU, uh, discovering the courage to fail. I mean, a lot of people think that we are all plastic surgeons. We have lived through life. It's been a rosy, dozy, cozy kind of life. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and my life has been one of failures. But I write about the man behind who saw everything I did, uh, who is Jesus of Nazareth. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, I, and I think that this is something where that's my pitch. And, uh, and and it's mercy all the way uh, that yes. I survived. Uh, but, okay, so I'm going to come to the last part of it, and that is creativity. Uh, mm-hmm. Because there are so many of young people joining up and signing up for creative writing and biography kind of courses. Um, how important is creativity to the writer? So it's essential. I mean, you have to give yourself permission to be creative. We give ourselves permission to make money. We give ourselves permission to be competitive, right? We get we we think that's the only way to live. But creativity is a very different thing. Creativity is going in and saying to oneself, "What have you got on you, and what have you got to share?" And it's I would look at it as a process of annotation of all the things that you've felt, heard, thought. It's all in there, and you've got to go in and annotate on one subject on the pitch. You know, if you're going to write about mercy or you're going to write about forgiveness. So creativity is the is the permission. I believe it starts with permission. Um, it, it it absolutely includes discipline. You, there's no creativity unless there's discipline. Because what's the point, right? Just to make a mess? No. To be creative with a goal. To be creative on this one piece. Um, but creativity is just the most wonderful invitation to self. What have you got? You ask yourself. What have you got? on your beliefs, right? On your book of who's standing by you. What have you got on you, Marion? What have you got to say about this today? And that's the invitation. That's the invitation to be creative. What greater invitation could there possibly be? You know, oh, I love you for saying it because invitation means everything to me for, for memoir writing. Uh, you know, I've always said this for many, many years as the founder of so many Asia Pacific consultations that invitations can change your life. How yes. you respond to an invitation can change the course of your life. I want to end with your own words. And that is, as we live, we learn. And if we write about what we learn, we share our humanity. That is, as long as we don't swagger and brag. How do people reach out to you? Would you just put in a plug now? I'm, I want you to tell Sure. Them. That's wonderful. Well, at marionroach.com, M-A-R-I-O-N-R-O-A-C-H, marionroach.com. We've got everything. We've got every kind of, we've got every level of class on memoir. And I've got a podcast too. So you've got your podcast. I've got my podcast for 103 episodes in. I interview writers and it's there for all for free for people to learn to write. It's my, I believe that it's not my energy to keep. I am just sending out into the world what I know. And I'm very, very honored to do it with you today. And I do it on my, on my website every single day and in all my classes. So thank you for allowing me to share this with your, with your audience. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving us your time. And, uh, and from all of us here in Hot Talk from Mary and Heidi, uh, we want to wish you well, your family, and at the same time, keep on writing and keep on swinging because uh, we like your dance, uh, whether, it's a, <laughs> whether it's a foxtrot or a jive, we've got to do it together. <laughs>